Uh, let's read together from the scriptures this morning. Um, thank you, Barbara, for playing. Uh, Psalm 26. Psalm 26. We'll read together the entire psalm. Reading, of course, from the authorized version. Psalm 26. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers. And will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. And tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. And the place wherein thine honour dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, in the congregation Will I bless the Lord? Amen. We know God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text this morning is taken from Psalm 26. And my subject today is entitled Help When the Words Hurt. Now, this, of course, is the sixth message in the series entitled help for struggling saints. I've already dealt with the subject, help in the midst of a family crisis, help when you're facing bereavement, help when you're battling depression, help for an embattled church from Psalm 79. We thought last week of the subject, help when coping with a personal crisis from Psalm 46. And now today I want us to think of the biblical and practical help when you're struggling with words that hurt. Now you've heard the old saying, the children here can recite it, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, I want to tell you children, that's a lie. That's a lie of the devil. Because the truth is, our words can harm, or they can heal the soul of a person. Our words can hurt or help an individual. And of course the Bible is full of words of wisdom. Not only words that are true and pure, but words that are wise. And we only have to think of one book of the Bible to reinforce that. The book of Proverbs. Uh, God's words of wisdom for, for life and earth. You see... As I think about the subject, help when words hurt, we've got to face up to the fact of the misuse of words. And when we read the book of Proverbs, we come across a list of verses which deal with the subject of lying and gossiping and slander and jealousy, and pride, and mockery, backbiting, sowing of discord, blasphemy. You see, the book of Proverbs really has a lot to say about words. And I was, of course, thinking about one of the key references in the book of Proverbs, and there are many, in relation to the subject of words. Proverbs 10 and 19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, But he that refraineth his lips 
is wise. You see, the abundance of words demonstrate what is really in our heart. And the, the, the nature of our heart is disclosed through the contents of the mouth. And here's David. And David remembers a godly man. A man after God's own heart. And in Psalm 26, he is in prayer. And he's talking to the Lord. And he's talking to the Lord about himself. And the context, the background is really unknown. But I have no doubt whatever the context and background is, David himself has been hurt by words. Now, now let me ask the question. How do you and I react when you've been lied about? How do we react when you've been falsely accused of something? When you're being slandered even behind your back? When your reputation is left in tatters? You've lost your integrity. You've lost your, your good name. And you interact with other people and you feel, even in the presence of some, that eyes are rolling in your direction. Fingers are pointing. Tongues are wagging. When, when you're being talked about behind closed doors, even when colleagues whisper about you, when friends are, of course, nice to your face, but given the opportunity, they would stick the knife in to your back. When they say things that are not true, not nice, not right, not, not good and helpful. How do we react in that situation? How do we react when the words hurt? And you see, that's what's happening in David's life in Psalm 26. I want you to notice three things. First of all, there's an important principle to remember. David says in verse 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. See, th th this has to do with speech. David was thinking of his speech directed in the presence of the Lord. Ecclesiastes 3 and 7 tells us there's a time to speak and a time to keep silence. And isn't it often true that we can speak about things, many things, the stuff of life, with very little thought? And I wonder, do we remember this important principle? And this is it, if you're writing it down. Our words can help or hurt. Our words can do harm or do good. And as we think about speaking, we should be thinking about, is this profitable? Or is this going to be perilous? Over there in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 15 and verse 1, we read, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I, I'm thinking of the subject. I, I was thinking before we speak, given that the Bible says there's a time to speak, given that David says that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Before you speak, let, let's, let's learn to weigh up the value and virtue for words. Four little thoughts come to my mind. Think of what we say. That's the content of our words. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that live it shall eat the fruit thereof. <coughs> what we say will affect other people. Do we realize that our words have the power of life and death? Therefore, our words need to be chosen carefully and well. Proverbs 10, 21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many, 
but fools die for want of wisdom. And you've got to think of the tongue of a righteous man. Words that he speaks enriches, words that he speaks helps, words that he speaks do good to all who hear him. And this righteous man, as he uses his tongue, he is an eye to God. He lives in light of eternity. He's going away beyond the temporal and the physical existence of his life. He's not only thinking of enriching another person with his words, but he keeps eternity's values before his mind. Think of not only what we say, but think of the way we say it. That has to do with our delivery. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You see, harsh words, hurtful words, harmful words, you know what they're like? They're like a sword thrust into the body. They, they could be described like the sting of a bee. Or, or maybe even the sting of a, 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 a rattlesnake, although I have no idea uh, what way a rattlesnake would sting. But it's not only what we say, the content, but it's the way we say it. A gentle, a gracious, godly tongue speaks well, chooses the words carefully. You've heard the little rhyme. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine to go down. How many children here find medicine so bitter? And you, you've got something wrong with you. And mummy has the big spoon and, and the medicine bottle there. And she fills the spoon and she says, open your mouth. And you, you're opening your mouth. And then it hits your tongue. You're, oh, you're screwing up your face because it's such a bitter taste. What they did in the olden days was they mixed it with sugar. Or they mixed it with honey uh, to, 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 to make it sweeter. And, and I just thought... If, if that's true, and it is, in, in olden times in relation to the taking of medicine, what about our words? Let's make sure that in our delivery of them, we're mindful of the effect that they can have on others. Think of when we say it. That has to do with our timing. You see, oftentimes we can say a thing, and a thing can be true, but we need to pause and ask ourselves, is it the right time to say it? You see, if we haven't got a listening ear, if the person that we're addressing isn't paying any attention to us, then it's not the right time. If we're going to get an angry response, a bitter response, a resentful response, there's no point in speaking. Better to wait. <coughs> Better to wait until the context is right. Timing is important. Doesn't the Bible say a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and a picture of silver? Apples of gold and a picture of silver. That, that took time for the artist. That, that took a lot of diligence, a lot, a lot of care to produce such a, 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 an artwork. He didn't show it straight away. He didn't come and say to the people, look what I'm doing. He waited until it was complete. And then he introduced it. And, and Solomon says to his son, remember he's speaking practically, father to the son. He's saying a word fitly spoken, son. is like apples of gold in a picture of silver. You have to have the right opportunity and time. And, and think also of why we say it. What's the motive? You see, the wise man knows the power of speech. He knows his words can help or hurt. He knows his words can heal or harm. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh the Lord Jesus said. Or if I put it crudely, what is down in the well comes out in the bucket. And the nature of our hearts are often disclosed by what comes out of our mouth. And a wise man, because his heart is right in the sight of God, he will choose his words. He will think before he speaks. He won't tell a matter merely regardless of the consequences. 
He, he'd want to collate all the facts. He'd want to think it through. Uh, he, he'd want to be saying to himself, is this true? Is, is this the right uh, way to say it? Is this the right time to say it? Is this profitable? Is it going to bring glory to the Lord? Remember in the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James and John was there. The Lord Jesus was there. Elijah and Moses came to talk with Christ about his um, exodus uh, from uh, Jerusalem, of course, thinking about his death on, on Mount Calvary. And then the cloud came and the father spoke. What did the father say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Hear ye him. He's the fount of true wisdom and knowledge. So here's an important principle to remember. There's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And when we speak, let's think of what we say, the way we say it, when we say it, and why we're saying it. Is what we're saying going to be profitable to this soul and bring glory and honour to God? Because we're living in light of eternity and we have an ear to the ear of the Lord Jesus. Remember the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the wise man will live in fear of God. His heart will be right. And therefore his speech, he will see to it. He has the tongue of the wise. He's a righteous man. And notice secondly, and very quickly, an important prayer to recite. Remember the context. And whatever the background is, it's obvious here that David has been hurt by words. He's been hurt by the words that people have said about him. And what does he do? He goes to the Lord. That's the first thing he does. He gets alone with God. You see, God's ear is open to him. He has God's undivided attention. God's eye is upon him. God's heart is for him. God's hand is with him. God's thoughts are of David. God is interested in David. And what does David pray about? Look look at verse 1. Lord, my reputation's in your hands. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Judge me. This is really a prayer for vindication. Lord, My reputation is under attack. Lord, do you hear what they're saying about me? Now remember, he's been hurt through their words. He's been falsely accused. We only could imagine some of the things that we're saying. David, you're a liar. David, you're a hypocrite. David, you're a Scrooge. David, you're against the work of the Lord. David, you're this and you're that. Now let me ask this. When you're in my reputation as under attack, isn't the natural thing to, to want to defend yourself, first of all? But you know, David got by the grace of God to the place where he put his reputation first and foremost in God's hands. And he left it there. And I want to ask this morning. Are you and I willing as a test of our godliness? As a test of the fact that we're saved by the grace of God. And true followers of Christ. Are we willing to leave our reputation in God's hands? Someone lies about you. Someone has gossiped about you. Someone is spreading juicy stories about you to spite you that aren't true. Someone's jealous of you. And before you do anything else, and there's other things that you can do, and we'll leave that with you, but before you do anything else, are you willing to put the matter into the Lord's hands? You've trusted him for the salvation of your precious soul. You've trusted him for help in your family crisis and personal crisis. Can we not also trust him when we're hurt by words? Can can we not trust him with our reputation? Lord, you know all about it. 
Lord, you know what they're saying. Lord, it's your opinion that really counts. Lord, it's your opinion of me that matters. And you see, David says, judge me, O Lord. God is my judge. David doesn't get mad. David's not wallowing in self-pity here. He's not saying, poor me. How dare they say that about me? He doesn't plot revenge. He doesn't try to get even. He doesn't nurse the hurt. He doesn't muse over it. He's not harboring bad thoughts. He goes to God. And he begins to pray. And the first thing he does, it's not the only thing, but the first thing that he does, he puts his reputation into the Lord's hands. And you see, we've got to remember, there's an important principle to remember to do with speech. Words can hurt and heal. So therefore be careful what we say, the way we say it, when we say it and why we're saying it. But let's think further than that. Here's an important prayer to recite. When you're hurt by words, put your reputation into the Lord's hands. Notice something else. Lord, my sanctification's in your hands. Look at chapter 26 again of the psalm. Verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. And I have walked in thy truth. Lord, you prove me. You, You test me. Lord, you try me. Lord, you know what's in my heart. See, David is not saying he's a perfect man here. He's not saying that he's, he's, he's not a sinful creature. David knows he's a man of flesh and blood like us, that he sins against the Lord on a daily basis in word and thought and deed. But he's saying, Lord, examine me. See, D- David is thinking, could there be an element of truth in what they're saying about me? And he's wanting the Lord to put his searchlight upon him. David is putting his heart and his mind in the Lord's hands. And he's saying, Lord, you can test me. Lord, you can try me. He doesn't put himself into the hands of a group of people like a jury of men or women that, that hate him. But he puts himself into the Lord's hands. See, the Lord knows his thoughts. The Lord knows the intents of his heart. <laughs> The Lord knows his actions. The Lord knows his attitudes. The Lord knows his doings and designs. Lord, you examine me to point out my sin. Lord, you take the divine microscope and see if what they're saying is true. See, it's a prayer about sanctification. Is that in the Lord's hands too? And that's an integral part of our salvation, isn't it? If you look at the words, Psalm 26 and verse 1, he talks about mine integrity. If you come down to verse 11, he says, But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. I was thinking about this word, integrity. (laughs) Mine integrity. You see, it has to refer to every aspect and every part of David's life. Integrity has to do with a a, a spirit of wholeness. David's life isn't decompartmentalized. It's not one part sacred and and one part secular. And and he has time for for sacred things. And then he has time for for secular things. He hasn't got a a religious life and then a non-religious life. And I can do my own thing and live like the devil. No, that's not true of David. David has this thought in mind, mine integrity, the whole of my being. Notice he's characterized by things he doesn't do. If you look at verses 4 and 5, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Now, now isn't that interesting? Lord, I haven't joined in company with the ungodly. I haven't talked the language that they talk. I haven't laughed at their their, 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 their dirty and filthy jokes. He's characterized by the things that he does do. 
if you look with me at verse 6 and 7, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I can pass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place wherein thine honour dwelleth. You see, David's a man approaching the Lord. And, and what's he saying here? Lord, I, I love you. Lord, I, I'm living for you. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. Isn't that a, a tremendous thing? He puts the Lord first. He, he, he has a mind to, to the place where God's honour dwells. And of course the Bible tells us, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And as I've said to you in the past, if we love the Lord, then we'll love the Lord's Son. Jesus Christ in every, every part of his person and work. And if we love the Lord and love Jesus Christ, we'll also love the word of God. And we'll love the saints of God. And we'll love the house of God. And we'll want the best for it. And, and no decision that would be made in relation to the house of God that would bring any harm to the work of God or, or hinder the work of God. And of course, for those that love the house of God, There'll be stickability. There'll be steadfastness. And of course the truth is that this is not something that comes natural to us. This is something we've got to pray about. When our hearts right with the Lord. When we've experienced the grace of God. And we have to admit that not one of us are perfect. Not, not when one of us are good or godly of ourselves. But the Lord knows us. And he knows that there has to be this exposure and this examination of our hearts. And even when our words have come against us and we're hurting. Can't we go to the Lord and pray. Lord. Examine me. Notice something else. Lord my redemption is in your hands. He says in verse 9. Uh, uh, through to eleven, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Look at these words in verse 11. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. Do you know what frightens David the most? That he would die the death of an ungodly man. <coughs> He's really saying, Lord, don't treat me like an ungodly man. When he says, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, that's exactly what he's saying. More than anything else in the world, that's what he fears, dying the death of an ungodly. What do you fear most in life? You know you've got a soul. You know one day that God will gather souls into his great eternity. You know that you're accountable to God. You know you need to be redeemed by the precious blood. You know you need mercy from God. Can't, can't you go to God this day and say, redeem me and be merciful unto me. And I want to tell you, if you pray that prayer, young boy, young woman, anyone in the church, the Lord will hear and answer that prayer. Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. David's thinking of men who are guilty of bribery. He's thinking of men of blood. And aren't there many of them in this wee province of Ulster? Many of them. And David is praying. Redeem me. Be merciful to me. You see, he knows he can't do anything to redeem himself. He knows he can't give anything to save his own precious soul. D David knows that, that the best of men need the redeeming grace of God. You see, this is gospel language in Psalm uh, 26. Those that tell us that there's no gospel in the Psalms, their heads are in the clouds. Even the most decent of people are on this earth sincere in whatever they do, they stand in need of the redeeming grace of God to be brought into a right relationship with the Lord. And David knows his redemption 
is in the hands of the Lord. So he cries out, redeem me. Be merciful unto me. And one for, final thing. And our time is gone. An important pursuit to regard. <coughs> you see, if you look at the end of verse 11, he says, but as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. He says already said in verse 1, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Verse 11, but as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Verse 12, my foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. You see, what concerned David most was that he would be in a right relationship with the Lord. That that he would maintain a good testimony. He's been concerned about his proclamation. Verse 7, that has to do with speech. Now he's concerned with praise. My foot standeth in the even place, in the congregation will I bless the Lord. And I was thinking, you know, in the context of words that hurt, here's an important pursuit to regard. Our own personal walk with the Lord. Let let me finish this morning. If you've got anger in your heart with another brother or sister, And you've sinned against someone. And you've hurt them. You've hurt them with your words. And you come to worship the Lord. And you're presenting yourself at the altar. And David talks about the altar here in verse 7. What are you to do? You're to get right with your brother. You're to go to your brother. Isn't that what Matthew 5 verses 23, 24, 25 teaches us to do? And then on the other hand, in Luke 17 and 3, if your brother trespasses against you, which has turned it right round, then go to your brother. Tell him his sin. Point it out to him. And do it so in such a way that you want to win your brother. Remember, as we close with Proverbs, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. Their contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's not impossible. But it's very hard. Words hurt. And especially in the context of a family. Brother to brother. Children to their parents. Parents to children. Words in relation to friendships. Dr. Samuel Johnson of America has wrote a book about friendships. And this is one thing that he said. A man should keep his friendships in a state of constant repair. A man should keep his friendships in a state of constant repair. Almost like the repairs of a car. The repairs of a ship. The repairs in a house. They're, they're, you have to necessarily keep upgrading. And, and that's what we're doing, of course, in the months. A man should keep his friendship in a state of constant repair. And if we have sinned against other people with our words. Or other people have sinned against us. Then, let's think about our personal testimony. Let's think about our walk with God. And let's make sure that like David, we can talk about mine integrity. That our speech in the sanctuary of the Lord and our singing will be true out of a pure and good heart. May the Lord take these few things.